Thank you for the introduction, Dan. So today I'm going to be talking about planning with PDR Plus and various reasons that will become apparent during the talk and restricting what we do to linear processes, so linear continuous numeric effects. And this is work I've been doing with Amanda Coles and it builds on earlier work I've been doing with um, Lumia and Berwick on planners like Colin, which you may have heard of yesterday at the tutorial. So what are processes and events? Well, processes in effect are things which happen in the world which you can't control. They were defined in the PDDL in PDDL Plus. Um, but a few examples here, things like the, the battery levels on some planetary device will start to increase um, at sunrise due to the effects of the solar energy from the solar panels and that. Or even anything down to just something which counts cost. So while someone can work at the end of the way, or chemical reactions, you mix things together and that's the actual happens. So the key thing is, if we define them in the language, is that they exist, but, but the important difference compared to the normal actions is that if their preconditions are defined, they will occur. So a process is something like a durative action, which will automatically apply whenever its condition is satisfied, and events are like normal instantaneous actions, which will automatically apply if their conditions we make two simplifying assumptions here, which we inherit from the validator, if you like. The first is that to prevent infinite cascades of events, each event must leave its own precondition, so it only happens once at each time step. And also, we assume that whatever goal you specify is sufficient to ensure that the goal you really want will persist. So, because after the goal is reached, we might have processes and events that occur in the future and we cannot guarantee the behaviour path, we just make this assumption that you specify a goal that whatever happens, the goals you actually want are going to be met. So I'm going to allow myself one slide of PDDL. It's not the nicest thing to read in the talk, but it's, it's quite a useful thing to, to see. So this is an example problem where we are trying to make a phone call with, with a mobile phone without the stick, so we've got really bad reception. So, to actually complete this activity, all we need to do is a few things. We need to switch on the phone, we need to travel to the city, and then we can make our call. The key things are the things which aren't faded out here. So, if we want to switch on the phone, we've got to have some battery, and then we start decreasing the battery level at some linear rate there. So, that you can read that as the battery, by the T is 1. And similarly, here, we can read that as the signal, by the T is 0.5. So, the signal goes up and the battery goes down. Um, our call action, um, quite simple, if we are at the city and we have a little bit of battery, then we instantaneously decrease the battery level we have to make that call, and then we add this back to call. Now that will persist, nothing will delete that back. So if you recall our assumption about the goal being sufficient, um, then that's going to ensure that our, our call is going to have been made. The processes and events here at the bottom, well, we have this process called data transfer, but if you have enough signal and you have enough battery, then your phone is going to start sending data. And that might be something you want to do. Um, you might be wanting to check your email, or it might be something you don't want to do, perhaps trying to buy some flowers without your wife finding out, and you don't want your phone to start transmitting your position so she knows you've got the devices. Um, and we have this other event here, which is a warning, but if you start to get low battery, so your battery is less than eight, and you haven't been warned yet, then you're now warned. So you can see it invalidates one of its own preconditions, so we don't get infinite warnings again and again and again. So I'm going to use this as an example to have this talk for full general details in the paper, but it's, it's quite useful to in terms of this example. So the first question, really, when looking at any language extension, is to think about well, what could, could we do with the language you already have, which in this case. PDL plus is an evolution of PDL 2.1. So could we do this in PDL 2.1? In a sense, yes. So if we have this process which is transferring data, we can make an action that says we're going to run this transfer process, and the overall conditions of that action are the same conditions we have in the process. But also we need to make sure that when we're not running this, that we really are not running this. So we have to take the negation of the conditions of the process, and say that we have this not run, which is a complement of it, and 
fact that the reasons you might want to replace us with several different options. So we would have not run transfer because on is false, not run transfer because signal is less than five, and so on. And in the puppy is the planning model, but as long as you couple them to say we have this instantaneous switchover from the point at which we're not running the process to the point at which we are running the process, then you can model processes in PDL 2.1. It's slightly ugly though because, first of all, we need to do the synchronization. And to do that in PWL 3.1, you have to start introducing these extra bookkeeping actions, which are called clips. So this clip essentially ensures it adds a fact to C at the start and it deletes it at the end. And the space short action duration is 2 epsilon, which is, um, if you're familiar with PWL, um, you'll understand what that means. If not, it, it just take my word for it, it's a very short length of time. That means if anything is going to happen within that interval, it has to happen at the same time. So we start the clip, apply that, apply that, and then end the clip there. And you can see each of these has the fact we add F there, we add X there, which is an end condition of the clip. So this ensures that we are binding these two actions together. So it can be done. Now because we're insisting that we have a synchronized switchover, we need to do something special at the start, and we need to do something special at the end. So we can do that again with just special one-off clip actions, a go clip which we bind to the start of every single um, process action, and a null clip which we bind to the end of every single process action. So this has to occur at time zero. We can use a time interval literal if you're interested in the details of how we do that. That can only happen at the start. And this null clip has the goal we want as a condition. And then it allows us to click around the end of every single process, whether it's done or not, and then it gives us the goal we actually want to achieve. So clearly, yes, we could do processes in PDL 2.1. And we can do events in PDL 2.1 with a very similar idea. We just have to click around this instantaneous action in the middle, which is essentially analogous to the event. You switch from not meeting the condition to the event, instantaneously meet the condition to the event, and then go back to not meeting. So we can do it in PDL 3.1. Um, but to be frank, it's hideous. It's a very unnatural model. And you still end up needing a very expensive planet. Even to reason with this, you need to deal with required concurrency. You need to deal with continuous numeric effects. So it's not like we can take from um, an arbitrary chemical planet and give them small money. And the big problem with all these clip actions is that because it's, inter it's inserting false choice into search, it looks like we're saying, well, we can start this clip now and then hope that somehow we can negate the conditions of the process and then satisfy the conditions of the process. Now, you might not actually be able to do that. So it means in each stage you have this massive increase of the branching factor, even though you can actually just be standing still and not getting it. One thing I mentioned yesterday briefly in my tutorial was that we also have to deal with permutations in temporal planning. So we can have states where you started six clips and actually not got anywhere. And um, we all know that those six clips are actually interestingly different for various technical reasons. So it's a problematic compilation. So the question is, can we do better? Well, the good news is we can do better. And to do better, we need to go and go hub our planner and start to actually put this reasoning about processes and events inside the planner. So in this work, we've been building on the planner of Copper, which is a planner that deals with PDL 3.1, and it has the continuous numeric effect machinery from the planet common in there, so it's a good basis to work with. So what I'm going to be talking about now is how we extend that to deal with processes and events. Now the key part that allows us all to work is that it uses a linear programming solver that takes the plan and it enforces the constraints of the model, <coughs> so the duration constraints, the constraints that model the numeric behavior of the actions, and it allows us to ensure that plans are generating meters. In this work, we're going to actually turn it into a MIP instead of an LP for a few reasons that I'll come on to later, but it's the same basic idea. So here's what the LP looks like that we're going to build on as we're going to extend this plan here. So we start with something simple, we're going to switch on our phone, and for each time set we have these, these variables which say, in this instance, what was the level of battery at the point where we switched on the phone, what well, is the value of the initial state, and what's the value afterwards, well, no time elapsed, so that stays the same. But you notice know, here, we now have this invariant condition. We have this overall condition that whilst the phone is switched on, 
we have a non-zero amount of battery. So typically in that case, because we know all 30, substitute 30 for there, it's greater than naught. In the general case though, we need to check invariance at the points where we are defining values of the variable in the interval during which an action has started but not yet finished. We can do a similar thing with travel to city, which doesn't actually have an invariant in the signal, so it defines a value, but it doesn't actually need to do anything else there. And it gets slightly more interesting when we actually put some of the rest of the actions in the file. In particular, the resource constraint you see in the bottom right here. If we want to make a call, then we have to have enough battery to do that. To know what the level of battery is, we use a linear program to tell us what the level is. So the battery level we have at step three is what it was after we last had an effect on battery, which was step north at the top, minus essentially the amount of time that's left between then and now, because we're using our battery at the rate of one per uh, time unit just to have our phone switched on. And also importantly, at the end of the line there, this has to be greater than north because this switch on action hasn't finished yet, so we still have to respect this invariant. So if we're defining a level of battery, that level has to define it. Has, has to respect the invariant, otherwise the plan isn't going to be logically sound. And we have some other temporal constraints there, for instance, that effectively forces the duration of that action to be 15, and that adds some ordering constraints to say, well, this has to come after the last action that had an effect on the battery level. So we have a sort of ordering of interactions with each variable. Now, the reason it's okay just to check these invariants at each point we essentially touch a variable comes back to our assumption that we have linear behavior. So if we suppose this is the level of the battery, it is okay to check if it's greater than north, for instance, here and here. And if it is, we know, because it's linear, that it was greater than north in the middle of that region, we don't have some, some catabolic effect or something like that. And similarly, if this is our signal level going up, then we can have some condition and some signal less than five. And we know that's true, if it's true there and there, we know it's true in the interval. So that's something we will exploit a bit further in this work. So extending this, essentially this LP style idea for processes and events, there are a few extra challenges we have to address. I'll start with actually what's, what's the nice thing. So what we kind of get for three by Start, starting to tinker with the planner inside. Well, in many cases, we can actually completely dispense with having to explicitly make these faux planning decisions about whether the process is going to switch from running to not running or vice versa. If we apply an action which makes the condition of the process necessarily true, so say we just have a process which is conditioned on some fact, and we have that fact, then we can instantaneously do the equivalent of switching from not running that process to run that process and synchronize that with the action itself. So we would add temporal constraints to the LP to do that. We get rid of all those plan steps. So instead of having to branch over what to do, it just happens now. Similarly, if we make the conditions for an event true, then that event just fires. So that's, that's something we get for free because of the fact that we know these things, processes and events, we don't have to branch over. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen all the time. The, the weasel word on this slide is the word necessarily true. And because we're dealing with continuous numeric effects, the values of the variables in a given state depend on the relative timings of what we've done in the plan, so the timestamps we've given to the action so far. If, it, if I give you a brief demonstration, suppose we've switched our phone on and we've started traveling and we're looking at what the values of signal and battery are now. Well, it depends how much time has elapsed between now and when it was we switched the phone on and when it was we started traveling. So we have these equations here that link the um, signal level to the amount of time that's elapsed. So if we want to ask ourselves the question, is this process going to happen? So do we have a region where signal is greater than five and battery is greater than 10? Well, it depends. If we started traveling straight away and switched our phone on straight away, so we did those both at time zero, then yes, we would. We have this shaded region here. It's an area during which we have enough battery, so that hasn't come down low enough yet, and we have enough signal that's cost this threshold there. But we can't say this process has to happen. 
Nor can we say how long it has to happen for, because we, if we delay switching the phone on, we actually have a much larger region here for which the condition to true. And conversely, if we delay setting off, we just essentially start the countryside and just let our phone battery go flat for a bit before we set off, then we never have a region during which the conditions of the process are true. So in this sort of situation where we have processes, the execution state of which depends on variables which are subject to continuous numeric change, we still end up having to do a plan step. It's not as bad as it used to be because we don't have to deal with clips, we just have a single plan step which is equivalent to simultaneously stopping a process and starting it, or vice versa. So, the other thing which I haven't mentioned so far really is events. This isn't just something which is limited to the numeric aspects of the domain, because events have propositional effects, or they can have propositional effects. So it's slightly worse when we don't know, for instance, how much data we transfer. We also might not know what facts we have. So we really do need to keep an eye on things. Um, we still need to use some sort of machinery to make sure that we know whether or not a process has executed, whether it's switched from executing to not executing, or whether an event has fired. Mercifully, we can exploit the fact that we've had invariants over all conditions in PDL 3.1, and we can push a lot of this reasoning into the invariant handling machine which we already have from PDL 2.1, which is already in the LP. So if I switch to here, you can sort of see these, these dummy transcepts that don't exist any longer, but they exist for the sake of argument, for the purpose of giving us the right constraints in, in the LP. So let's start off. Um, initially, we are transferring data and we aren't warning us that we have a low battery because we don't have the conditions of those men. Just a deep tap the back at the top there. So we're not transferring data because we don't have enough signal, and we're not issuing a warning because we don't have a small enough value of battery. So for the sake of the argument, we can actually say, well, let's suppose we have those as invariants which we're expecting. So we are expecting the invariants, but we aren't doing those things. And then we can add the plan steps as we did before, so we're going to switch on and we're going to travel to the city. And we now, because we have to expect invariants, we now check it when we apply this first plan step that we really are transferring data. So that's the negation of the overall condition on transferring data there. So I get plugged into there. An interesting side effect of this, having to check extra invariants, is the switch on action itself. All it does is change the battery level of the phone, so it starts this negative effect on the battery level. But because this is jumping from variant here, it refers to battery and it refers to signal, but we also need to define what the level of signal is to make sure that invariant has been met. It gives us a slightly more overt consequence here, where travel to city itself doesn't refer to the battery level, it's just increasing our signal strength. But again, we've got to check this invariant, because if you want to check an invariant which refers to signal, then you pull in this disjunctive invariant here that refers to battery and signal, which means we have to define the value of battery, which means we now additionally have to define what the value of battery is at the state, and it means we inherit, inherit the additional invariants which are going on, on battery. So you can get this contagion of invariants if you need to check. But we have another process which has a condition on battery and Wi-Fi, but it gets even worse still. Traveling to the city, on the face of it, all it's doing is changing our signal strength. But because it's changing the signal, we have to check this invariant at the bottom here, which depends on the signal and battery. But because we're now checking up an invariant on battery, we also have to check this invariant, which is on battery and Wi Fi, which means just because we look at the signal, we also need to define the levels of the battery and Wi Fi at the state. So the formal details for which invariants you need to check are in the paper, it's something which is manageable. But it's just an extra thing we have to be prepared for this year. And then it's in particular because we're dealing with these disjunctive this invariants, which aren't something which the planner handled previously. Now, a bit of a headache. I've kind of glossed over some of the details. I've just had them on the slide and said you need to check them at this point. Unfortunately, it's not sufficient just to check them at these points. We cannot simply check that this disjunctive invariant holds at that. Um, uh, step zero, so whatever that time is, and we can't just check it holds there. Why? Well, if we just check it at this end, and we just check it at this end, 
but we might think, well, we're okay because at time zero, we've got so little signal that we know we haven't started transferring data. And at this end, we've got so little battery, we know we aren't transferring data. Unfortunately, there's this crossover point in the middle where the condition was true. So it's not a single linear constraint anymore because it's a disjunction. We actually can't just check the conditions at the end anymore because we might actually miss out these regions in the middle when the condition was actually true. We also can't insist that one of the conditions holds at both ends. So we can't say that signal has to be less than 5 at the start and it has to be less than 5 at the end. If we're too restrictive, we lose completeness. So what we really need to do is allow which condition we're going to rely on to change halfway through. So we say we can start off in this instance, for instance, by insisting that signal is, is less than 5, and then at some point in the middle, we can switch to insisting that battery is less than 10, and then at the end, we can insist that battery is less than 10. Now, if we do that, we're OK. But there is a choice here about and which one we allow to be true at the start, in the middle, and at the end. And what we don't want to have to do is discretize time and start doing things where we have to check at time more, one, two, three, four, five, etc. Et 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 Fortunately, if we have a disjunct which refers to n terms, so this one refers to two terms, then we only need to add <coughs> n minus one w steps, w steps whose only purpose is, is to allow you to change which one you're going to align. Why is it n minus one? Well, that's a slightly bigger example here. We're referring to three terms in the disjunct invariant, so we want this overall to be true. And we can satisfy this in several ways. What we could do is at the start we could say, well, blue is greater than 10, and we can rely on that until here, and then we're going to switch to relying on something else. We're going to rely on green is greater than 5 until here, then we're going to switch to relying on red is greater than 5. So at most it's, it's two points in the middle, one there and one there for a term comprising three um, conjugates there. Or it doesn't really matter if you pick the wrong one. Suppose we say here, well, we're going to start relying on three greater than five. We're still going to rely on three greater than five there. And also here, that's why we're going to switch to relying on red greater than five. That's also still okay. So it's at most n minus one. You don't strictly have to change which one you rely on. You just have to be allowed to change if you want to. Now, the reason for being Formalism for encoding that is slightly technical, so it's easiest to refer to a sort of intuitive example here at the bottom of the slide. So between travelling to the city, the start of travelling to the city, and the end of travelling to the city, we have to respect this invariant that the signal is less than 5 or the for battery is less than 10. Two terms, so we have one changing point in the middle there. And essentially, we need to find one of these which holds on the left hand side there, we can use signal less than 5. I need to find one of these which holds on the right hand side there and battery less than 10. Now, if we can't find that, then it means we actually couldn't be much invariant to go that interval, and so we'll have to backtrack and do something else. This is the LP for that, these are all details which you've already seen. The key thing to focus on is this bottom right, on the sort of gold colour here. And this essentially says that either between step one and now, we either have battery less than or equal to 10 in step 1 and battery less than or equal to 10 now, or we have signal less than or equal to 5 uh, at, at step 1 and signal less than or equal to 5 now. So this is where it becomes a mix because essentially there's free choice there to switch between which one of these you're going to expect. And we do a simpler thing here between the study step and step 2. So between these two constructs here, we've actually now made sure which disjunctive invariant is going to hold or that it can't hold in certain amount of backtrack to do something else. So some results. So we said, obviously it's a workshop paper, we don't have as many results as we'd like. Um, one thing I would encourage anyone here um, who, who has a planning approach, it doesn't have to be a planning approach, in terms of PBDL, it can be anything which can string actions together and make some decisions. If you have something which could solve these sorts of problems, I'd be very interested to hear from you. Um, we are trying to get um, a couple of different options, TLR or LPSAT, we couldn't get them done before. Eugene Murphy, we've been talking to Dan, we're like some scope there, but we need to think about discretization and to scale the new heuristic. 
as I say, we might have some non PDL approaches that are interested in hearing from you. So, for this talk, what I'm going to compare to is the plan of pop up, so the plan we built on, using the compilation of PDL 2.1. This is quite nice in a way because it's essentially giving us a measure of what is the benefit for actually handling processes and events directly rather than trying to compile them away and using the existing plan. The domain I'm going to be looking at, so we have a satellite domain, um, which is related to one in the, in the column the journal paper, where we have a process for sunrise and the process for sunset. So we have the solar power level that's changed throughout the day. And we have to plan around that so we can only do certain activities at certain times due to power availability. We have a, a domain based on power substation management, so dealing with energy transformers. The interesting thing about this domain is that it has an event that if the voltage we're delivering goes out of range, then the goal becomes unachievable. If you are interested in planning for metal electricity substations, then you should go to Kiara Continues and talk later in the week. And then finally, um, one of our own domains from last year, where we're looking at the line of the shipping fleet to be problem. Here we just have a cost accounting process that whilst the ship's sailing, so, so whilst it's left one service and before it's joined another, um, then you have to pay a cost per hour for the essentially the cruise waivers. So three different sorts of, of PDL cost domains there. In terms of the results, it's quite promising. Um, it kind of shows the the pain it causes to the planner to deal with this compilation. Um, the red line is our process and event planner. The green plotted line, which you can, it's fairly present, is, is the planner reading with the compilation. If, if you actually look at what it's doing during searches, the search phase is exploring, it really is the presentations of the clips and all these extra bookkeeping actions, not than actually doing any useful work and actually making progress towards the goal. So, scalability seems to be quite reasonable. If you, in less than 10 seconds, it, it's monthly to find solutions to these um, quite large shipping fleet problems there. Um, over here, we get this interesting effect in the transformer domain. So the even number of problems are winter, and the odd number of problems are summer. And in the UK, there's less energy demand in summer because we don't use air conditioning, we use heating, so we use more energy in winter. So the summer problems are actually easier to solve, there's less work to do on the longer supply side than the new demand because of fast demand. So to conclude, I've talked about forward chain search and the three challenges really for looking at doing um, process and events in forward chain search are we need to know what the state is, it's kind of one of the fundamentals of state to based search, we need to know what the state is. We have to manage these disjunctive conversions because of how to negate conditions on processes, and we have to synchronize things to make sure that processes happen essentially as soon as their conditions become true. It's more efficient than doing the compilation, and what we get out of it is the only fully automated linear, so linear um, or quadratic for instance, um, PDL plus. Thanks.